But what I want to do is basically take you through today in the first lecture, we'll look at mRNA biology a bit, we'll talk about localized translation. Um, some of you may be familiar with it, and that's great because I'm going to stop and ask you questions, and you're going to raise your hand and be really enthusiastic. Others of you might look really confused. I will not ask you questions. Um, but if you do make eye contact, uh, that's pretty much the kiss of death. Um, where we start, so I was actually flicking through um, a recent publication of science. So this was from March 23rd. And I actually found a wonderful link to this whole conference. So there's a perspective talking about RNA targeting and translation and axons. And it's about this report here looking at mTOR. And the quote that stood out, they actually pulled it, was further understanding of the basic mechanisms underlying mRNA localization will lay the foundation for developing new therapeutic approaches for many neuronal diseases. And this was considered one of the first uh, localized RNAs in axons. And here we see it. So this is after injury. Many of these transcripts uh, of mechanistic targeting of rapamycin are targeted here to the injury area. And they're actually then locally translated in order to then to drive uh, uh, um, recovery within that region. All right, so this is actually quite interesting to think about. There's also a nice example in Drosophila um, that's unpublished of RNA localizing into axons. And we'll talk a little bit more about dendrites in a bit. But this is hopefully going to frame uh, a little bit of what we're going to now um, take a step back and look into. So we start off with why would we localize an RNA? And can I pose that question to the uh, extremely enthusiastic students that I've just complimented? Why would you localize an RNA? Or should you localize an RNA? That's what happens, especially after proteins in special cells. Excellent. So you want to get proteins in certain areas. All right, so instead of localizing the protein, which might be considered more sort of uh, labor intensive, you localize a transcript. That's excellent. Why else might you want to do that? So it gives you local protein in a local place. So that's the place side of it, or the, or the location. Exactly. Wonderful. So we're talking, whenever we discuss RNA, we're looking at not only the place, but also the time. And so that's the localization and the translation. So whenever you hear localization of RNA, you really mean localization and translation. Yeah. So just bear that in mind as we go through. So what are some of the biological roles? So we hear this lovely uh, number of examples. So one is asymmetric division. So this is when an RNA is taken to another cell. And the reason we mention this is from ASH1 in uh, Cerevisiae, uh, where it's going to be important for mating type switches. So we'll look a little bit more of that in a bit. You can have localized signaling, so it's important for targeted secretion. So you can have molecules that will then be secreted based on uh, where they're localized. We know that from Drosophila as well. Cell polarity, it's going to be important for the cytoskeleton, for apical basal polarity, um, for movement, for adhesions forming, all of those things. Uh, to facilitate protein localization, so this is important for uh, things like spindles, mitochondria, ER. Localized determinants. So I'm a developmental biologist. We really care quite a bit about how we get these different determinants in different areas, because that's going to then give us differentiation, changes, patterning. And for this audience, especially synaptic plasticity. So it's important then to localize RNAs, and there's a lot of work in dendrites that I'll mention in a bit. So some of the general concepts to bear in mind, and I promise you most of the slides will not be this text heavy, uh, we look at localized translation, conserved for targeting protein expression. Thousands of RNAs have been localized, have been shown to localize. That's a bit of a fudge. So I do just want to take a moment and mention many people see RNAs that are enriched or protein patterns that are enriched. That doesn't necessarily mean that the RNA is localized. All right? So that's just worth bearing in mind. They can get to very specific regions. They're always going to form what are called ribonucleoprotein complexes, or RMP complexes. We'll discuss those in a bit more length. That's because RNA is single-stranded, unstable. Right? It's going to form loops. It's going to have protein binding all the time. Uh, localization is linked to synthesis, processing, RMP assembly. We also see that the formation of these RMPs is highly dynamic. So we're having protein-protein interactions, protein-RNA interactions, constantly coming on and off of the RNA. We see some beautiful examples, and so these are just some of the more famous examples. VEG1 uh, in panel A localizes to the vegetal pole of the developing uh, frog egg. 
We see examples from uh, Drosophila in panel B where bicoid is at the anterior, Oscar at the posterior. These are two determinants that need to be translated at the right time, in the right place, in order to get these patterns uh, for the early embryo and also for the pole cells. Uh, we see examples from sea snails here where these localization, you can see it's about to divide and the RNA shown in red is localized to four of the cells. Uh, and that will then be this next example of determinants. I'm just sort of skipping ahead. You see here, uh, these are in cultured mammalian hippocampal neurons, the localization of CAMK2 and MAP2. Um, so we see again that these are uh, completely, uh, wildly conserved, very common to find in many different types of cells. So what's the difference? How are we on our RNA biology? Would you say you're an expert on RNA biology? Awesome. So where do we start if we're talking about RNA? Where is RNA, where is it born if we're talking about the life cycle, if we want to personify our RNA for this conference? Transcription. From transcription. Excellent. So we're going to get transcription in the nucleus, which has inexplicably been left off this slide. Uh, we're then going to get a piece of RNA. As I mentioned, it's always going to have proteins associated. So it's going to have a cap binding to the five prime. It's going to polyadenylate. So we get this addition of, of these poly A tails, which is going to be important for binding proteins. All within the nucleus, we're going to get uh, our exon junction complex. We're going to get our splicing. Then we're going to contact the nuclear pore. The nuclear pores, as uh, some of you may be aware, extremely complex. How we trans, uh, how we uh, how we're able to export different types of RNA would be about a three lecture series. Very boring, actually, I lecture on that. I find it very boring. Um, sorry, does anyone? No. <laughs> you always gotta worry when you start making fun of different things with such a diverse audience. And, uh, but anyway, so I find it quite uh, un uninteresting, so I won't actually talk much about this. Um, but then once the RNA makes its way into the cytoplasm, we're gonna get this protein exchange. So certain factors that are actually pretty similar to the factors that come on so for sta uh, stabilization or stability, also for controlling the RNA, uh, will then be exchanged. And we're going to get initiation factors. We're then going to get ribosomes loading on. And we're going to get translation in the cytoplasm. This is often actually linked with nuclear export. However, for localization, we're actually going to have a pause in this step. Yeah? So before we get to the translation, we're actually going to move the RNA. We're going to localize the RNA. We're going to do things to the RNA in order to get that very specific uh, localized translation. At all steps, just to reiterate, of the gene expression pathway can contribute to this regulation and this translation. So not only is it at the transcription level, it's also at the splicing level, different proteins coming on. If you get the wrong proteins associated, you might not get localization, you might not get translation properly. Through the export as well, all the way into uh, once it's being localized, and this is a very key step. When we have RNA, it's not only that we're going to be um, translating the RNA, but we need to actually degrade the RNA and turn it over. All right, so there's always something to remember. And this regulation as we go through within the cytoplasm can involve many different types of RNA binding proteins. And we can form all types of different associations. So here's just a few of the examples. You can see the polyosome, you can see the RNA granule, different types of particles. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about processing bodies in a bit and stress granules. And these are two types of biomolecular condensate. So these are non-membrane bound regions within the cytoplasm that are going to be enriched with certain proteins and certain RNA. We also see the uh, risk complex. We also have the microRNA pathway playing a role uh, when we talk about uh, what's happening within the cytoplasm. And all of these have come actually from a, a review that looks at uh, neuro, uh, neurological diseases. And you can see some of your favorite actors here um, being important. So things like uh, TBP43, for example, uh, plus um, personally as well, FMRP there. So you can see nice examples of what is happening within the cytoplasm. And these processes are all contributing uh, to different types of neurogenesis. So we see a nice, uh, sorry, neurogenesis. Neurodegeneration. Uh, we see a nice example of health, uh, these healthy neurons being supported by the glial cells. And we see what happens here with neurodegeneration. And you can see misfolded proteins, and you're getting abnormal uh, accumulation. You see problems with the uh, lysosomes. 
Linking back to the lectures you guys have heard, we also see these altered glial cells, as well as um, problems with the mitochondria. All right, so this all does sort of fit together quite nicely. What I'll be focusing on here is this impaired RNA uh, homeostasis. So we know that if we have problems with the RNA, we're not translating the RNA properly, um, if we're binding certain proteins, we can actually lead to, to this neurodegeneration. So that's sort of a quick uh, introduction there. Now we're going to pivot a little bit. We're going to look at what mechanisms could be used for localizing RNA. I'm not actually sure why it's cut off. It's not cut off on this, so I apologize. There's a question mark, I promise. My, being American, sometimes you get criticized for your English. Um, but I do remember sometimes to put these uh, question marks in. So we're looking now at, uh, at what mechanisms could be used and what types of factors would be required. So is anybody familiar with sort of the most common um, localization mechanism that you might see with RNA being taken to a certain area of the cell? What might be involved? Shout it out. Wow me. Excellent. So active transport, which is uh, not the correct answer, but one of the answers. <laughs> um, and active transport is going to involve molecular motors. Uh, here depicted uh, this lovely structure. It's going to involve important uh, proteins binding to the RNA, so linking proteins. It also involves, as was mentioned, the cytoskeleton here. So we have the cytoskeleton, um, which is going to then be the track which with the motor can move. And you can think of it almost like uh, a train where people have drawn that also as cars on a highway. It's going to link, take the passenger, move it to the destination. At the destination, we're then going to anchor. And then we have a, either a delay or we get local translation, which enables us to then get this directed uh, protein expression in certain subcellular regions. And there's some key factors that are going to be important for this. One is within the RNA. So within the RNA, we would term these cis-acting elements. And the cis-acting element has been identified to control the localization. And here was one of the first, uh, or the first, to be identified. And this was done in 1993, and it was done by Rob Singer. And he termed it a zip code, which is similar to what we might call a postcode. Right? So it's how you get the mail, uh, back in the day where we had mail, uh, to the right place. And what they identified here within the uh, three prime UTR, so in the untranslated region of the RNA, was this structure here. And this zip code, which they identified, could be moved to other RNA. And it would then be taken to the same place as uh, this ASH1 RNA within yeast. We see some really interesting aspects when we look in, in Xenopus now within the frog, and you can see that this localization element for VEG1 again lying within this three prime untranslated region, has very specific uh, repeats and has these short repetitive sequences that are required for its localization to the vegetal pole. And we can get even more complex when we talk about uh, bicoid RNA. So this is the anterior determinant within Drosophila, one of the more famous localized RNA. And its three prime UTR has been dissected at quite some length. And the localization elements that's been identified through mutagenesis and through um, the taking sections away from this, uh, in this RNA, was able to break down basically to show you that you need this for early localization, the light blue, later localization, and early, the, the entire sort of four, five, and uh, loops, and also for the anchoring aspect, you need this therm arm. One of the things we talk about RNA, you can type into mfold, which is a program <laughs> that will fold your RNA to its lowest energy confirmation. Be a little wary of that. Because many times these proposed uh, structures that you would get are actually pretty ridiculous. And they're going to have loops, and they're going to have, you know, half the bases aren't going to be bound. And it really is a little dubious. Um, there are some real experts, um, and they'll tell you that it actually depends on many other factors. Also, uh, quite distant sequences can have a role in terms of which of these uh, loops form and how the stem loops form. So just be, be conscious of that. And the other factor we need then, so in addition to these cis elements within the RNA, is going to be what are termed transacting proteins. So these are proteins that are going to bind to the RNA. Here's some different examples. They're often going to have these uh, RRM domains, so these are RNA uh, recognition motifs. They're going to be double-stranded RNA binding proteins. 
Uh, and you can see some, some classic examples uh, that are going to be important. So HNRMP, for example, having multiple RRM domains. And these are great areas then to make mutations, to then start to ask questions, what part of the protein is required to bind to the RNA? And the flip side of that is, what part of the RNA is required to bind the protein? Right. So whenever we're talking about this localization or localized translation, we're really talking about two different things coming together in order to achieve it. Just to give you a full description, a couple other protein mechanisms that are identified. One uh, additional one to active transport would be this local protection from degradation. So you can imagine a scenario where you just throw RNA throughout the entire room, but only in this area is it being protected. Not that I'm good at protecting anything, but being protected uh, from degradation. Whereas in the rest of the room, we'll have you know, endonucleases, exonucleases chewing up the RNA to destroy it. And that then leads to translation only in one region. Uh, and finally, we can have this diffusion coupled to local in entrapment. So this would mean that we throw the RNA around the room and maybe we start mixing up the room a little bit. And as we mix it up, it's only going to stick oh God, when it hits this wall. Yeah? So now it's going to stick when it hits the wall. So when you come in contact with the wall, you stay here. But otherwise, you're just being churned around. And you can only then be translated once you've been anchored. And oftentimes, this anchor will be something like in the cytoskeleton, such as actin. We found actin to be quite a common anchor. So this gives you three different examples of how uh, RNAs can become localized and locally translated. And we've now talked a little bit about some of the factors that are going to be important when we dissect this. Um, so I am ADHD, which is joyous because it means I can't focus very long. So now you have your first quick break. So I need you guys to turn to your neighbor. I'm in a zoology department as well, so that your break involves animals. So I need you to turn to your neighbor and see if you can figure out what these four eyes are from. Yeah? Get a partner. Come up with the four. I'll give you the quiz in a second. Yeah. And then if you get all four right, I'll give you some type of prize. I'm counting on nobody getting all four right, because I do not have a prize. <laughs> I mean, yeah, two of the three are. <laughs> all right, we got them all? Who's got number one? Or who's got any of them? Raise your hand. Who's got any of them? Go ahead. Elephant. elephant. So number four being an elephant. That is actually not correct. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Uh, well, uh, uh, what, can we start with one? Chica? No, no, no. Chica. <laughs> <laughs> What's number one? Number one is a fish. Yeah. Octopus, not an octopus. Stingray? Not a stingray. Squid. Not a squid. <laughs> it's a puffer fish. <laughs> you know the puffer fish, the one that gets really big? Yeah, yeah that's puffer. What's number two? Uh, okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> didn't mean to offend you with such an easy question. <laughs> All right, smart Alex. What's number three? It's a shark. Very good. Very good. So this is a white-tipped reef shark. So that's a shark. Um, well done. And uh, it's not an elephant. But you're, you're right, exactly. So this is a rhino. Well done, well done. Did anyone get all four? No, good, good. That's what I did. Okay, you'll have another break in 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> This is my way of making sure you're conscious. Um, so how could you detect the RNA? So one of the things we often like to think about is what type of experimentation is going to be required. So I want to take you through a brief history of it, uh, in part because um, things have really changed and there's quite a lot of, uh, of new technology that focuses on looking live. So a lot of what the work would have historically been involved in is looking at uh, fixed tissue, and now we're able to actually follow the RNA. And one of the techniques I'll show you at the end is be able to follow the RNA and the protein uh, translation at the same time. And this is all pretty cool stuff. But if we go back in history, uh, some of the first in situ hybridizations were done within these Drosophila wax samples. So an in situ hybridization is a way in which we can tag or label DNA or RNA within a cell. So it tells us where it is. And what you do is you make a probe that's going to be single-stranded and antisense to the region that you want to bind. So you put your probe, it's quite an extensive uh, protocol, and in fact, this one here with radioactivity, um, my advisor did 
in the 90s, and it, he would basically put it on and go on holiday for a month and then come back, which sounded great. So he would disappear and try to make wildlife films because he thought he was David Attenborough. Um, and then he would come back and see this, which would make him very excited. <laughs> so nowadays, we might quite view it a little differently. But you'd see there, these are payroll genes in Drosophila. And you can see these lovely uh, stripes. You can also start to notice the RNA being present or nascent transcripts being made within, uh, within the nucleus. Nowadays, we'd use something slightly more advanced, which was going to involve fluorescence. So this is a fluorescence in situ hybridization, or what's termed FISH. And we can actually, uh, in many cases, look at individual RNAs. So now there's products on the market from people like Stellaris or hybrid chain reactions, where we're going to get multiple probes and we can see individual RNA transcripts, or at least that's the, what's being proposed. And you can use FISH in combination with antibodies, so classic antibodies binding, so immunohistochemistry. Uh, and we can then see these co-localizations. And we can see in this example, as the RNA gets closer to the pole, it becomes more co-localized with certain factors. A variation of in situ hybridization, which will give us much, much higher resolution, involves uh, ultra-thin frozen sections and electron microscopy. And this technique, which is uh, even more labor intensive than anything else we'll talk about, and you had a bit of an introduction to EM uh, previously, but you're going to embed the sample. You're then going to cut it with a diamond tip knife to get 60 nanometer, so 60 nanometer sections. You then collect those, which is not trivial, and they fly away constantly because of static electricity in your clothes or your hair. And in fact, we, use, we used to use Dalmatian hair, you know Dalmatian, the dog? the hairs from the belly of the Dalmatian to flick these because they, were the, they had nice little natural points on them. So you'd fix it to a little stick. So you're using Dalmatian, single Dalmatian chest hairs to actually try to pick up these sections. Uh, and then once you have these sections and you've collected them, you'll then label them. So you can do an in situ hybridization overnight. Um, you can get these probes then, which you can see these uh, antisense probes binding into your section. They also have a, a way in which we can label. That's the little uh, knobs on it. Then in the second labeling, our antisense probe is now bound to our RNA. We use a primary antibody to recognize our probe. Then we use a secondary antibody that is conjugated to a gold B. So for electron microscopy, we want something that's electron dense. Um, so we can then see the gold B. At the same time then, uh, after we've done the first in situ to see where the RNA is, you can then also label for protein with a primary antibody and a different sized gold B. And what you get is extremely high resolution. So you see an example here on the top, that's RNA being localized into these certain uh, cellular regions. And here's an example which we're very excited about. This is a microtubule. And each one of those black dots is a five nanometer gold. Right? So we've, it, it, we can see individual membranes. You can see very, very fine structures. And these uh, 15 nanometer gold dots are RNA transport particles. So that's an RNA <coughs> literally on a microtubule. Be impressed. It was damn difficult. <laughs> yes, please. So there's two things. One, uh, this has not come out very well, but you can see uh, the cross section. You can actually see the membranes on it, uh, or well, the, the structure of it. And then the second is we've used antitubulin here to label. So this is uh, antitubulin labeling, and well, it's pretty specific um, overall. Sometimes we would actually try to call it a microtubule that we'd section laterally because it looked like a microtubule, but that was more my advisor <laughs> than, uh, than me at times. But uh, yeah, so this was, uh, it's a great question on that. Sorry. Yeah. Can you double chain on this? So two proteins or two RNA? Well, whatever. Yeah. Two antibodies. Yes. So we could do. Uh, one RNA, and I think it was up to two or three proteins. Now the RNA, the problem with the RNA... Yeah. The problem with the RNA is you have to heat it up for quite some time for the in situ part, and so that can damage. Um, you typically would do the in situ, then you would fix, a quick fix with glutaraldehyde after you've already fixed with formaldehyde, and then you would start the, uh, the antibody stain. And typically, there was a guy who was quite good. He could put two or three antibodies in. But then it's a matter of actually getting the right um, conjugated gold. You also run out of gold sizes. 
So this is five, usually it's five, 10, and 15. As you get bigger, then it's hard to get the gold bead you know, into the sample. Um, and seeing the difference between 10 and 15 should be trivial, but can be slightly difficult. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would say three labels is pretty much the max I've seen. Uh, another technique, if we now want to think about looking live, you can actually take an in vitro transcribe RNA. So you can take the cDNA, you can make in vitro transcribed RNA, you then physically can inject it into the cell. And once it's injected then, um, you can follow where it goes. And the clever part here is when you've done this in vitro transcription, you've added something fluorescent, some type of dye to the use. So when you do the transcription, uh, every 10 use, for example, uh, will then have some type of fluorescent label, usually an Alexa dye, for example. And these are quite bright. Um, shockingly enough, they also localize quite well, which might be surprising. Drosophila is quite resilient as well, so you can poke a needle into it, pull the needle back out, everything's fine. Uh, here's an example of that. So here we've injected the RNA into the center uh, of an embryo. The blue is the nucleus, and you can see uh, this is uh, a second injection of green RNA. We've already had the red RNA localized to the apical side there. So we've uh, used an alexaphore um, for red, and then we've also used it for green. Yeah? Is, is it not visible? Like, how is it possible? So it's always bothered me. Uh, because you would expect some level of degradation. You're putting a lot of RNA in, which is the first issue. The second thing is, especially in Drosophila, it's not naturally going to be in that position, so it might not be binding to the right trans factors, but it does get localized oftentimes. Um, enough of it gets there. Um, it does actually get translated as well, quite highly, uh, in fact. It gets translated ectopically, so before it even arrives. I can tell you more about the caveats to it, but yeah, surprisingly enough, it does work quite well. I, 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 so I, I worked with a guy named Alon Davis uh, for my postdoc. We would fight constantly about this technique because I came from a different technique school, and he would always point to this being better than mine, and it would just be epic battles. Uh, another really cool, and I just want to mention this um, technique, and I'm really sorry that all these... Uh, uh, the references have fallen off the bottom. I'll move them up to the next talk. But this is from Simon Bullock's lab, and what they've done is at the LMB. They've taken uh, fluorescent RNA, and they've put an aptamer that can bind to a streptavidin B. So they've made this fluorescent RNA. They then make a lysate from Drosophila embryos and pour it over. And what they're able then to do is get the motors to bind to the RNA, pull out the RNA and the motor complex together, and then they can take this complex and put it onto a slide where they've grown microtubules. And this enables them to do a technique called TERF, which is total internal reflection microscopy, well, with fluorescent microscopy. And what it means is you get extremely high uh, temporal and spatial resolution. And you can see some examples here. So these are fluorescent RNA moving on a motor along a microtubule. And on the top, you can see that really nice processivity in one direction along this microtubule. And you can also see this bi-directional motion of a different RNA, uh, looking very nicely at how these motors can, can, can process and, and move. All right, so the technique that I personally, the one that Alana and I used to battle uh, life and death over, uh, was one that was developed when I was just getting into graduate school. And this is involving two different transgenes that can be put into the Drosophila. All right, it was first done in yeast, then uh, about four years later, we put it into flies. So this is uh, labeling with what's called the MS2 system. And the MS2 system involves this MS2 bacteriophage. So it's a bacteriophage, and these phages are going to have RNA-protein interactions. What we've done is we've taken advantage of that RNA-protein interaction to label the RNA with the GFP. Because right, if you remember, you can't get a GFP onto the RNA because the RNA is made of a very different molecule. Than the, than the protein. So the first transgene will have our promoter, our gene of interest, and we're going to insert into the untranslated region these stem loops. So these are loops that form, or uh, these coat that are going to then bind to a coat protein. So this is RNA that's going to be inserted in loops into the three prime UTR. Then a second transgene that we're going to put into a different fly will be the coat protein that will bind the stem loops fused to a GFP. 
So now we have a, a protein that can then decorate the RNA when these are being co-expressed in the same cell. So these stem loops bind to the coprotein. Now they have the GFP attached. And you'll notice there's this nuclear localization signal attached to the protein transgene. That means all the excess protein, which is still fluorescent, will be taken into the nucleus. So this then gives us better uh, signal to noise within the cytoplasm. And you can see on the left, this is from Cerevisiae. That was ASH1 RNA. This was the first time it was shown. Uh, in 1998 from Rob Singer's lab. And then here's an example that we were showing for Drosophila. And you can see this part of these movies are on loop. But the middle one there, you can see the RNA running and then reversing. Uh, and this, which is very dark and, and kind of horrific, this took me forever, so I include it. Uh, you can actually, maybe if you squint and dream, you might see some faint microtubules there labeled in green. Yeah, And that's RNA in living tissue in a developing stage 11 Drosophila. That's bicoid RNA moving on a microtubule. Yeah. That was a reviewer comment. Bastard. <laughs> all right, so this MS2 system now has led to all types of, of new techniques. So if you have an RNA loop that you can use, and you have a protein that can then be bound, uh, that can then bind to the RNA and has a, a fluorescent uh, molecule, like a, a GFP on it, you could imagine now having two. So you can have a different loop that's going to recognize a different coprotein. So that's called PCP, not important. And then you have the MS2 coprotein. So you could have two RNA to see if those are together in a living cell, or you could see actually um, different parts of the RNA can be labeled. So they actually looked at export, because the green should come out first than the red, depending on the orientation of the export. You have other ways to do biochemistry, where you can now code it to a, um, a streptavidin to get a biotin. Uh, bead, so now we can actually pull out the RNA of interest and we can look at what proteins are bound. And the cool technique that's just been developed uh, a couple years ago, uh, what they've done is they've taken, at the DNA level, if there's an epitope tag, there's a protein of interest, and then these MS2 stem loops. So then at the RNA level, you have this epitope tag, tag still present, protein of interest, but now you have the MS2 protein binding. So now you can label the RNA in this middle step using this MS2 system. And then when the RNA is translated, you're going to have these epitope tags now in, uh, ahead of the protein, and you incubate uh, an anti-epitope uh, fab that then can bind the protein as it's being made. And they've shown proof of principle here. And you can see here now that you get a green and a red together within this cell. And that is the RNA, and now you're watching translation in real time. And they can show on the, um, a nice graph here, so you see the RNA and the protein, and when you add puromyosin, which is then going to block translation, you're going to then lose the protein over time. And as you get out towards 240 seconds, you notice we've lost that protein. And here's a control where the RNA and the protein are together. So this is where the technology is taking us. I'll show you another uh, version in, in the next uh, talk. But this is now enabling us to watch, uh, in real time, RNAs being translated, RNAs being moved, to ask questions about uh, how we can actually address these mechanisms of localization. All right, break two. Yeah? These are easy. Yeah? Dead easy. Talk to your neighbor, figure it out. Not yet, not yet. Do you have an actual question? Science question? Oh, no, no. Not yet, not yet, not yet. <laughs> Give the, give the people a moment. It's meant to be a break, so they refocus. All right. Let's hear it. Number one. Frog. Frog. Excellent. You guys are budding zoologists. You're all in the wrong field. Number two. Just the domestic cat. <laughs> it's not a panther, it's not a black panther, it's not a jaguar or a leopard, it's a, just a domestic cat. What's number three? Tiger. Yeah, all right, thank you. Good. So that's a Bengal tiger. Tiger. Yeah. What do you know it's Bengal? Because I have a bigger picture of it. <laughs> are there other types of tiger? Yeah, there's other tigers. Yeah, of course there are. <laughs> 
No, I'm being shamed. All right, smart Alex, you're three for three. What do you got here? What kind of owl? You said bird. Oh, this is. <laughs> I see Fabian's education stopped at the molecular level. <laughs> so that is a great horned owl. So you're absolutely right, it's not. Have you guys ever seen a great horned owl? Yeah. They're huge. They're like that big. I found one once. Yeah, I found one dead in a barn. Um, no, I didn't take this picture. But thank you. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for making that. And it turned out I tried to get the owl stuffed. This was actually in Wisconsin. Um, so I tried to get it stuffed, like, so I could put it on the wall. I didn't shoot it or anything. And it turns out they're incredibly endangered. And basically, by having one, you could be arrested and taken to prison. Like, bang. And so the guy's like, where'd you get it? I'm like, I found it. He's like, did you? And I'm like, yeah. And then he's like, you should probably not do anything with it because it's an endangered species and you will be taken to jail. <laughs> and I said, thank you. Click. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's a great horn dog. Uh, excellent. So transferring back seamlessly to RNA. You can all go back to bed now. Uh, classic examples of localization. So I just want to give you sort of a tour. As I mentioned, this is a conserved mechanism. We know a lot of different things from a lot of different systems. And that's going to be important uh, to link together what we're talking about within Drosophila. So we have patterning and development. So this is in Drosophila. We get this localization um, to the posterior. Then we get a protein gradient that's going to then be important to pattern the animal. We see this is quite common in many different systems. So this is in development, um, not only in Drosophila, but you see examples from, uh, from frogs, from zebrafish, uh, and from other species as well where you get this localized RNA that's going to be important to build the patterning within the developmental context of that animal. And you'll see some uh, classic RNAs like Wnt uh, and Veg, um, Bicoid, for example, that have been shown to localize. You also have cell fate determination. So this is, again, going to be really important if we're trying to change the fate of a cell. Uh, this is for cerevisiae, where we're then going to have Ash1 local, locally translated in the budding daughter cell. Once it's in the daughter cell, then it's going to uh, lead to uh, a mating type switch between the mother, um, because of the HO and the nucleus, uh, versus the daughter. Right. As far as cell fate determination, we also see the examples from sea snails and from ascidians, where we get these localized RNAs to one side of the dividing cell. Once that cell is divided now, we can go through and turn on different pathways. Within the Drosophila neuroblast, so this is for the formation of the nervous system, which you guys have met previously in the course. Uh, you get this different localization of Inscutable and Prospero to different sides, and that's going to then result in the neuroblast, which is a stem cell. So that will re uh, remain as one neuroblast. And then we'll have differentiation because of the process of Prospero and Inscutable, among other proteins, um, being locally translated within the ganglion mother cell. That ganglion mother cell will then go through one more division uh, Prospero, being in control, as uh, Shakespeare wrote him to be, uh, will then uh, go on to make glia and neuronal uh, projections within the Drosophila. Okay. If we mislocalize these RNA, right, we can lead to different types of neurogenic defects. We can have excess neuroblast, and that's going to be at the cost of other tissue, or we can lose uh, the number of, of neuroblasts and ganglion mother cells that we have. So these are critically important. They're also conserved. Uh, in lots of different cell types, this, this process, which is quite cool. Uh, another example is looking at cell migration and motility. So this is looking in cells. Uh, these are chicken fibroblasts, where the first work was done. And we get this localized uh, localization of beta actin to these uh, uh, extending or towards the focal adhesions. Then we get locomotion based on this local translation of beta actin. In addition, when we're looking at migration motility, uh, this is an example uh, from growth cones. So this is work from uh, Christine Holt, among others, looking at, uh, at a growth cone. And you get this localized uh, uh, population of actin through the localization of beta actin RNA. And it's usually in response to some type of guidance cue, which will then cause these growth cones um, to, to, to move in a certain direction. So this is an, ex uh, an external stimuli can give a change in where we localize the RNA and where it becomes translated, then lead to movement. I can show you a few examples from Christine Holt's lab. Um, you can see on the left there, these are movements of these granules 
um, within these Philopodia contact sites. So you can see that uh, we're getting this contact where the arrow is pointing. So it's actually contacting up high. And you're seeing this movement out uh, towards where that contact is taking place. And here you're seeing Nectrin 1 um, being introduced. And that's going to cause these granules to go into certain Philopodia based on where uh, that, uh, that signal um, is being received. So there we go. So it's being added. And now you're going to see them go out in these projections. Another one that you guys may be fairly familiar with, um, maybe not, but if you aren't, this is within dendrites. So here we would see the mRNA being transported. It will then go into a dendritic spine, where then we would have this local translation. So this local translation can lead to synaptic plasticity, uh, morphogenesis. Also, it's thought that uh, you're going to have activity that's going to then drive this not only localization, but also then the control of when the RNA becomes translated. And that can then help to build these projections. Okay. So that's just kind of a quick whistle-stop tour um, through a number of different systems and a number of different requirements. Okay. And we'll home in a little bit in a moment. All right, last quiz, last uh, group of birds. These are all birds. Yeah, and then I'll have 10 minutes about something much more exciting. Yeah? yeah that's so get a quick, quick look on your birds here. All right, what do we got? <laughs> Starting in the upper left corner, what do we see? Ostrich. An ostrich. Excellent. An ostrich, which is beautiful eyelashes. It's made for L'Oreal commercials. <laughs> do they, they, make, they make mascara, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I could have gone the wrong way. Um, good. What do you got in the next one? Uh, anybody? Parrot. Yeah, but what kind of parrot? Yeah. So this is a macaw. These are common. These are the big, uh, not the big, the ones that are pets. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the big, the big uh, red, and that's a green macaw. Yeah. New neotropics. Yeah. Good. All right. It's a tough one here. Toucan. Oh, that's not bad. Not bad. It's not a toucan. It is not a hummingbird. It is pretty much the opposite in size from a hummingbird. There we go. So it's a crane. It's a crested crane. And your final one, hopefully someone maybe recognizes. Nothing. It's nothing? <laughs> yes, this is a made up bird that Tim is just messing with you. Somebody from that side of the room, you guys have been quiet. Hiding in the back. No, you're close. Arctic? No, no. Yeah, well done, who said that? Nice job. So that's a king vulture. So that's a vulture. You can actually start to see the mouth projection here. Um, they're just horrible looking. All right, there are no more breaks, so now you must pay attention. <laughs> what I'm going to do now is take you through, we've talked about localization, we've talked about getting to the right place. Now I want to talk about translation, and translation at the right time. And I want to introduce a concept, so this is going to be pretty important for the next section. It's sort of an emerging field that started, I mean, it started really about 10 years ago, but it's taken on a bit of a, a, a big push in the last kind of three years. And what we're going to deal with here is looking at biomolecular condensates. So said a different way, these are molecules coming together. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Just molecules coming together and biological molecules coming together. Um, you'll, you'll see the fingerprints of, of physicists on some of the jargon, so I apologize for that. Uh, we know that the RNA and the proteins are going to exist together in these different complexes within the cytoplasm. Some of these complexes will form, such as stress granules and processing bodies. And these are unique because they're not membrane bound. All right, so the other organelles that you can see here, the ER, um, the multivesicular bodies, those are going to be bound by a, a physical outer membrane. Whereas these biomolecular condensates that we're interested in, these granules or bodies, right, these are going to be proteins coming together, but they're not going to be membrane bound, which means they can grow in size quite rapidly. Yeah? They can have different proteins associated, different RNAs associated with them. And here's a, uh, from a, a recent review, which has been cut off. You can see 
a number of different granules and bodies that have been defined. And the ones that we'll be discussing in quite a bit more length are the ones called P bodies or processing bodies. You also see maybe you've had some exposure to stress granules, which is going to be when you stress the cells, you get these larger um, biomolecular condensates of stress granules forming. You also have germ granules, so this is where um, the pole cells or the future gametes, the egg and the sperm, they'll also have this uh, important uh, factors that are going to be involved within uh, germ cells. And then you can see, in fact, there's all kinds of, of bodies that are also going to be present within the nucleus. There's been a lot of literature recently on nuclear speckles, for example, um, and codule bodies, which is one of the first ones to be identified. So U bodies are slightly different from P bodies. Um, basically, they have a different factor in them. Um, I, I'm always reluctant to show this slide. We don't really know what's in each one of these because studies come out where they found a protein. Um, so there's, it's not depicted here, but somebody came up with a new one called a GW182 body because it has GW182 in it. And that's the special one because your lab works on it. So, you know, so they're, they're basically, and the reason they're so close to each other is that they actually touch oftentimes, and we'll see that in a minute. So it's not quite as separate. Um, and this is also a collection from all different systems, um, although many of them are conserved. Um, so this is a review that uh, I found on the way it's not published quite yet, but you can get it online. And it looks at this uh, process for this biomolecular condensates to form called phase separation or protein phase separation. And there's some jargon that I need to introduce you to. So the review does a very nice job of laying this out. But first off, they're talking about a feature um, that they find in these protein phase separation, and it's going to involve this conformational heterogeneity or disorder within the proteins, and these are going to be in intrinsically disordered proteins or intrinsically disordered regions. So it's this disorder within the protein, um, and many of these intrinsically disordered regions have uh, a biased amino acid composition, and it may be repetitive in the sequence, and this then gives us another term which is called low complexity domains. So these are regions within the proteins that have been identified to help form right, these, these bodies or these collections within the cytoplasm. And if you're interested, there's some really nice work there um, within the review. Here's one nice example to show what can happen to these biomolecular condensates. And it involves this transition in phases. So we start off in the solid phase where we have this uh, weak interaction, it's quite dynamic. Uh, you can see a nice example here of FOSS within uh, in vitro. So you have this uh, disorder, nothing's really too, uh, too put together. And then we go through the different phases. So we can form a liquid. So now they come together. And this is where we'd start to see a body forming. They can also form a gel. All right? So they're going to get more organized, more structured, right? less uh, simple for things to move in and out of them. And they can also then form these highly ordered and very rigid structures. All right? So this would be the solid form. And you can start to see these wonderful extensions. So these are some of the plaques. If you start thinking about neurodegeneration, some of these might look like uh, amyloid fibers, for example. And this is thought to be then a solid state. And to link it back to some things that you've already heard about, so looking at uh, TBP43, for example, in a normal neuron where we have proper splicing, our microRNA processing is good, our RNA is being transported, we have a stable RNA that has binding uh, with TBP43, for example. If we add stress, the RNA goes into these stress bodies with other RNA binding proteins. Everything's in good shape. Whereas here, in a diseased neuron, we're not getting the right regulation within the nucleus, whether that be microRNAs or other aspects of the RNA. We have now problems getting uh, our RNA exported. We also have stability issues, which then leads to these RNA binding proteins coming together in higher concentration. Right? These low complexity domains within those proteins being important, because um, if we knock them out, we'll, we'll block it. And especially then you see the example of TBP43 coming together right, to form these solids and these plaques, if you will, um, depending on your terminology, that can then lead to serious problems within the neuron. So the phase separation is not only being driven uh, by the proteins that are present. We can also have scaffolding from the RNA. So this is just some nice examples 
of mechanisms that are regulating this phase transition and building these different biomolecular condensates. So it can involve RNA um, binding. It can also involve this oligomerization. Um, you name it, basically, have been identified to be important to form these structures. So from a, uh, a slightly broader, when we're talking about the regulation of these structures, and this becomes then important for therapeutic options, so if you're trying to form them, but also trying to break them down, we can have concentration has been identified as being important to form uh, the different stages of the phase transition. Also, the presence of RNA and certain uh, sequences in the RNA can then lead to the formation um, based on these proteins coming together on an RNA scaffold. And also, uh, post-translation modifications within the protein can also then lead to these formations, which is then going to be critically important for disease. You also see in, uh, some of the uh, more general things that have been identified from um, most all of this is from in vitro work, but you can get aging, mutations, uh, different changes in pH, uh, stress, which can then lead us from uh, a loosely organized way to a highly structured solid. And then you can have chaperones or hydrotropes like ATP that will take you back the other direction, which can be important then to break these down. And I am going to stop there, actually, because I'm conscious of the time. And I will pick it up, and we'll look at a lot of the work that we've been doing now on processing bodies, um, which are going to be conserved in the next lecture this afternoon.